We are going to be continuing in our series called Evangelism Made Simple tonight. And we do have a book available for you. We'd love for you to get this book. It's called Evangelism Made Simple. I co-wrote it with Dr. Phil Stringer. This is the book, uh, How to Make a Clear Presentation of the Gospel. Um, and these are available right now tonight in the Resource Center. The material that I'm covering I think would be very helpful for you to have uh, all the details of what I'm going to say. So chapter 10 is where you'll find what I'm going to speak on tonight. And some of the things that I say you might forget. You probably will forget because I forget. So if you have something and it, somebody asks you a question, you can say, what did, what did we cover on that one Sunday night in October? Oh yeah, go grab the book. So I'm going to give this away free tonight. Who wants this? If you want it, just come up here and grab it. Somebody better want this book. So somebody come up and grab that right now. Or not. Nobody? Okay, Patrick, at least take the book. Would you take the book? Yeah, thank you. Oh, you have somebody coming? Okay, Patrick, would you hand it to this nice young man? Thank you. Did you want it? Did you want it, Patrick? You probably already have one. Okay, let's give this wonderful young man a hand. Good job for you. My guess is your mom made you do that. <laughs> uh, but the book is very helpful. We also have a DVD series on all of this as well. Dr. Stringer taught his chapters. I taught my chapters. So if you want to get the DVD, uh, we have lots of uh, tracks. We have a, a workbook. Uh, we have different uh, translations. So we have Spanish, French, um, Arabic. Um, I don't know if we have it yet in, in Tagalog, but we have a lot of different translations of that book too. And uh, it's been a very popular book. When you share the gospel, you will probably come upon someone that horror of all horrors asks you a question that you don't have an answer for. What are you going to do? Well, I suggest that you stay on the gospel. Stay on the gospel. I'm not saying that you ignore the question. But I am saying that the most important thing is you stay on the gospel. So how do you handle that? Well, you can answer the question right then and there. If you don't have an answer, you can say this. That is a really good question. I don't have an answer right now for that. You know why people will accept that? It's because people accept and appreciate honesty, especially these days. It's just that I don't know. But I will, I know there's an answer, and I will find it out. But until then, let me get back to sharing the gospel. Sometimes questions are diversions. Or they want to argue. But... Get back to the gospel. Stay on the gospel. If we didn't learn anything else from dad, it was stay on the gospel. So when you're sharing the gospel, and that'll take a lot of pressure off. A lot of people don't witness because you don't want somebody to ask you a question you don't have an answer for. So it's okay to say, I don't know. Though there's always an answer. And you can find it. If you can't find it, you can talk to us. We'll help you find it. But you need to find those answers. You need to know these answers you're not supposed to memorize the answers either because then you sound like you've memorized answers, but there's answers to questions. When you talk to people, they are going to ask you questions. And what are you going to do about that? Well, tonight we're going to cover some of the common objections that people will ask you. I believe that there's only about 20, 10 to 20 questions, objections that people are going to ask you. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty easy thing, actually, to learn a good answer for all of them, especially since tonight we're going to cover that, and next time uh, that we have an evangelism made simple message, uh, you will learn some more of those answers. There's usually about, maybe at the most, 20 different questions or objections that people will ask, and it's not that hard to learn what those are and be able to answer them or some variation of those 20. Sometimes the person that you're talking to has a legitimate question about the gospel. And I would say right then and there, answer that question. 
Sometimes they have an argumentative question. And you'll be able to decide which is which. And if you have that argumentative question, A, don't get mad, don't get angry, don't argue. Don't argue. Uh, arguing is, is not productive. Answering a question is okay, it's productive. Stay on the gospel. Stay on the gospel. Sometimes they're asking you to throw you off track. I don't know. You won't know always either. But how should we respond to an argumentative question? Well, the way to reply is say something like this. I do have an answer for you, and I promise to give it to you in a few minutes, but first let me go over a few things with you from the Bible. So you're not, not answering the question. You're postponing answering the question, especially if you feel it's an argumentative question. With this kind of response, you avoid, you avoid getting into the fray with the person, and uh, you're still able to share the gospel. And you're gonna find many times after they hear the gospel, that question isn't a question anymore. Someone once said, let truth, not emotion, be your authority. And that's important when you're witnessing. Truth, not emotion. Don't get emotional, don't get angry. <laughs> you're trying to share the gospel with this person. So it's hard sometimes to, to not uh, wanna argue or you know, get into an argument, but that's not what we're here to do. You're not gonna argue someone into the faith. Uh, witnessing takes someone who has meekness. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, we're told in verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So that's the idea here to go into this with humility, with meekness. Don't get into an argument. You're gonna feel frustrated sometimes with the questions that come your way, especially if the questions come at you from a not so nice tone. But the truth is, we need to be patient with the lost, remembering that once we didn't understand salvation either. So therefore, let us strive, 1 Peter 3.15, to have the answers. And let's work hard on having the answers. And again, that's why you're here tonight, to learn how to answer common objections. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for a reason of the hope that is in you. With meekness, there it is again, and fear. That doesn't mean fear like fear that I don't wanna do it, but just with the understanding that this is a serious thing and I wanna enter into it seriously. Also know that logic alone does not bring people to Christ. There is always an element, element of faith. While you should strive to have an answer and the proper response for the lost person, remember what Paul said under the inspiration of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, in verse four, he said, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. So in other words, you don't have to just get everything exactly right. You should, be, you should strive to have answers for people. You should study to know what these things are, the best way to answer people. But don't go into it thinking that if you have everything perfect, they're gonna get saved. They might not. And if everything isn't perfect, if you don't say everything exactly right, it's, it's the gospel that saves them. It's the spirit of God that's convincing them of the gospel. So just give the gospel. Don't be so afraid that you're never gonna do it. Not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Here it is, but in the power of God. And I really think that if you're going to step out on faith and do what God told you to do, we know God wants us to witness, God wants us to go and share the gospel, and uh, we know that that's everybody, right? Boys, girls, men, women, young, old, we're to share the gospel, uh, but the power is the gospel, right? So get back to the gospel, always get back to the gospel. It's not about how good you are with your powers of persuasion, but how good you are at persuading the unsaved person that God really does care about them 
and God really does love them. That's the key. And with that in mind, let's talk about some of the common questions and objections when you share the gospel. Number one, and we're going to cover a handful of these tonight and more of them next time. I don't know if any of you have ever had someone, as you're sharing the gospel with them, say, the Bible is full of errors. Any of you ever had someone reply with that? The Bible's full of errors. So what's a good way to reply? Well, we just put it up there. I guess we could have separated that out. So here, there we go. So now you don't know. Okay. Okay, so what do you say uh, when, when someone says the Bible is full of errors? Well, the first, the first and easy way to respond, not snottily, uh, but just say, can, oh, really? Can you give me an example? And I promise you, one out of 100 will give you an example. 99 won't. Why? Because 99 people have heard people say the Bible's full of errors, but they have no idea what, what an error in the Bible is. So they can't give you an example. You say, well, what if it's the one of the, 90, of the 100? Well, so <laughs> if, that, uh, if that's the case, I'll uh, give you a couple examples. Obviously, we can't look at every example, but there's really not many. There's a few times in the Bible that there seems to be a contradiction, just a few. And I'm just going to give you some of them that people will mention. And so if they've mentioned these errors, the one out of the hundred, mention a couple of these things, you'll at least know how to answer. So the first, the first one that comes to mind, a few people might point out, what seems to be an inconsistent, inconsistency in the Bible, uh, in, in Proverbs, and it's only one verse apart, which is really interesting. Have you ever read... Proverbs 26, 4. It says, answer not a fool, according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Okay, so if you find a fool and he is foolish and he asks you a question, don't answer him. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Until you read the next verse, answer a fool, according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. So is this a contradiction? Is this proof that the Bible's full of errors? No, it's not. It's actually a common literary tool called parallelism. You, you have one idea like this. Don't answer fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like him. And then you build on that with another truth that might seem to be contradictory, but it isn't. It's a parallel truth. In other words, this, if this doesn't work, then this will. In verse 4, we're told to, answer fool, to not answer a fool according to his terms because you have to stoop down to his level and become as he is. But then in verse 5, it teaches us that there are times when a fool must be challenged and you have to rebuke that fool according to his folly. So what seems like a contradiction is actually really good advice, okay? So it's just a little bit of understanding, a little bit of study. What seems like a contradiction is actually really good advice. Another person might say, well, um, there's, there's a discrepancy in the gospel's account of when Jesus died, okay? And so there is. In Mark chapter 15, we read that Jesus was crucified the third hour. Okay, according to the way that they would keep time, the first hour was sunrise, so the third hour would be nine o'clock in the morning. And then we find in John 19, 14, that he was going to be led to the crucifixion about the sixth hour, which would be noon. So why would one say he's being crucified at 9 a.m., or the, the, the third hour, and the other one say the sixth hour or, or noon, uh, how is that, how do we contradict, or how do we uh, bring those two seeming contradictions together? Well, the answer is simple. They did not have Apple watches. They did not have precision, timing, time-keeping uh, instruments. They had the sun. And that's why they would say they are the different hours. And it's, it's judgments, right? It's not very precise. We are very precise. We're down to the second. 
Quinton Road Baptist Church, we start at 11 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. And you do. We do a good job at starting on time. And uh, not so good at ending on time, but that's, that's a whole other story. So you have impreci- imprecise time. So let's say he was crucified around 1030. So when you say the third hour, that could be a window between 9 a.m. and noon. And if you say the 12th hour, that could be another window. So it's actually the person's estimation of what time it was. It could be, let's say it's around 10.30, that means it could have been referred to as either the third hour or the sixth hour, depending on the person's perspective of what time of the day it was from that section of sunlight, the third or the sixth hour. Again, I don't think the lost person is going to ask you that question. I don't think they're going to know that that's in the Bible. And again, I don't think it's a hard problem. I don't think it's a contradiction at all. It's not an error. I think it's just the viewpoints of the people that witnessed the event and uh, the way that they would be able to tell time. But the lost person, I don't think, is going to bring these things up. But if they do, a little study will help you find an answer. It's no big deal. So don't let that paralyze you. Don't let that keep you from giving the gospel. By the way, the, the Bible does not have errors, but all other books do. When we're, reading, when we're writing Evangelism Made Simple, no matter how hard we tried and how many layers of proofers we had and editors, there's always errors. I don't understand. How could that be? It's not a huge book. It's not an encyclopedia. And we worked hard on editing that. But they were still, there were still errors. And uh, that's maddening. That's maddening. And I think every book you'll find, you'll find something. And I actually love it when I'm reading an article or I'm reading a book and I find an error. Oh, I'd love, I'd love it. Unless it's my book or my article. But the Bible doesn't. Okay? The Bible doesn't. And so that's a wonderful thing. Objection number two. Someone, I don't know if anyone's ever asked you, uh, objected or answered you as you're giving the gospel with this. Jesus never existed. Okay? How would you reply? Well, here's the answer again right there. How would you reply if someone said Jesus never existed? Well, here's an answer. No historian uh, denies that Jesus existed, okay? There's no debate on the historicity of Jesus. He lived. Now, the question isn't, was he a historical figure? For he was. I don't think any of you question the existence of George Washington. Do you? I hope not. Because we have it pretty solid grounds through many historians that he existed. Well, there's much more evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth existed. So there's really no debate in, uh, even in uh, any academic circles. They all believe he existed. Now, maybe you should say this. Don't watch as much History Channel. Maybe you should say that. No, don't say that. Don't say that. But this is not a serious argument. No one doubts the existence of the historical Jesus. Uh, there's other extra-biblical authors that write about Jesus. Uh, Cornelius Tactus, uh, Thallius, uh, Josephus, the Talmud, all refer to Jesus as having actually lived. Okay, So that's actually quite easy question. But that's really not their question. If he did live, which everyone agrees that Jesus did live, The question is, was he who he said he was? That's the question. And I think you would turn that question, just like I did, just explain, there are many uh, historical sources outside the Bible that, that verify Jesus lived. That's really not the question. The question is, is he who he said he was, God? That's the question. And the Bible says that he created everything, that's in Hebrews 1, 2, that he sustains everything, Hebrews 1, 3, and that he died for everybody in John three sixteen. The Bible says everything came from him and is upheld by him, Colossians 1, 17, and is going back to him in Romans eleven thirty six. So I think you need to say that to the person that denies the existence of Christ and say, no, here's what the Bible says, that he created, he sustains, he died for all of us, and everything came from him, 
and is going back to him. So ask the person if they're ready to stand before him. That's a good way to reply. Are you ready to stand before Jesus? Objection number three. Somebody might ask you this. A per, or they might say this. A person ceases to exist when they die. Now, I think that's really sad if that's what people think and if that's what they, they believe. And many do. Many do. Wasn't it Bill Nye in the, uh, in the debate with Ken Ham basically said, uh, we, are, we, are, we are really nothing. When, when we die, there's nothing else. We, we, there's nothing more. We just go back to dust and that's it. I, I just think that's such a sad outlook. And it's just, I, I feel so sorry for that person. But people, many people th- will think this and say this. So how do you respond? It never hurts to respond with scripture, folks. Never, ever, ever hurts. So here's a verse that you can memorize or, or you can look up for this person. In Hebrews 9, 7, it says, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I think if you just read them that scripture, quote them that scripture, deep down, they know there is something past the grave. Deep down, that's why people cry out to God when they're about to die, even atheists. Everybody does. Why? Because we know there's something after grave the grave. So I'd say they know that too deep down and quoting them Hebrews 9, 7 and then maybe follow that up by asking them this. When you do stand before God, will you be clothed in your unrighteousness or in Christ's righteousness? That would be a good way to answer that question. Number nine, or sorry, number four, objection number four. Supernatural things like the Red Sea or Jonah being swallowed by a big fish and living to tell the tale, get it, uh, could not have happened. I don't believe in the supernatural. It just seems too, uh, too hard to believe. And the response, oh, it's not on there. That's really good. It's because there wasn't enough room to put it on there. And I don't give these guys much time, so I'm not criticizing them at all. I'm just telling you that this is better. Okay, right? So how would you respond to this? I'll just throw it out there. How would you respond to this objection, supernatural things just couldn't happen, like uh, Jonah or the Red Sea? How would, how would you, oh, you have it in your notes, don't you? Oh my goodness. Okay, so you know what's coming. Whether a person believes in any part of history or not has no bearing on whether it happened or not. So it's really, it really doesn't matter what we believe about an historical event. If it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it didn't. So that would be one way to answer it. And you could continue to say, one is not wise to quickly embrace something without proper evidence. I mean, there's people that believe that man did not go to the moon. Uh, but I investigated this. I sat down and questioned an astronaut who walked on the moon. And he gave me the only proof that you need, okay? Point a telescope and the landing site of Apollo 16 and you will see his lander and his rover. I'm like, are you kidding me? You can see it? He's like, yeah, if you have a powerful telescope, you can actually look at the spot and you can still, you can still see the footprints. How did those get there? Well, Hollywood put them up there somehow, you know? So there's concrete proof, there's evidence. It's empirical evidence, so I think it's not wise to quickly embrace something without evidence, but once we have solid evidence, we must embrace it as true. The Bible is the most credible piece of literature ever written. It is irrefutable when compared to secular history and archeology. span Now here's another thing I would, I would answer this person. Jesus believed in Moses. He, ble- he talked about the burning bush in Luke 20. He talked about Adam and Eve. He, locked, he talked about Lot's wife being turned to salt. He talked about Jonah and the great fish. Jesus believed these things, and if he is truth, which he claimed to be truth, if he rose again from the dead, then all of these miracles are verified right then and there. That's all I need is Jesus believed it. If he's God, 
which the resurrection verifies that he is God, then that answers in the affirmative all those things did indeed happen. Objection number five. And by the way, if they, if they still reject it, there's nothing really else you can do, right? I mean, you've given them a good answer, a, a legitimate answer, and, uh, and you just let the Holy Spirit. By the way, remember, a lot of times people will continue to think about what you've said. It might not, they might not be convinced immediately, but the Spirit of God is working in their lives. Okay? So uh, relax, relax. You have, you have God on your side in this. And uh, he'll really help you, by the way, with some of these things. And he'll give you things to say that you never even thought of. And that's what's wonderful about witnessing. Objection number five might be this. There's no way all the animals could have fit on the ark. I'm sure you've heard that one. How many of you have heard that one from someone you're witnessing to? That's very common. So therefore, if the story of Noah couldn't have happened, then the whole Bible is suspect. So how would you respond to that? Well, first I would start with Jesus mentions Noah in Matthew. And if he rose from the dead, that establishes him as God, and he's truth. And uh, therefore, if he mentions Noah, he mentions him as a legitimate historical figure, and therefore the, the story of the ark as well. But I think we can also go a little further with this one especially and do a little math. How many of you like math? Simple math. Simple math. Okay? There's two questions that you have to ask to determine if the story of Noah could be plausible physically, scientifically. So the one question is this. How many types of animals did Noah need to take on the ark? So the Bible tells us that he was to take two of every kind, right? And so then was the ark large enough to hold all the required animals? That's all we have to do. We have the, we have the size of the ark, roughly, and we, have, uh, we can count the number of kinds. And what's a kind? Well, you don't have to have a boxer and a poodle and a chihuahua. All you have to do is have a male and female uh, dog kind. And that would probably be more like a wolf that have all the genetics intact. The poodle has no genetics left. Okay? Boxer somewhere in the middle. The chihuahua, I don't think, is on the scale anywhere. So how many then, how many animals would there be? How many different kinds? And people have done a lot of work on this, and they've come up with, there's probably less than a thousand kinds. You say, what about extinct kinds? Well, even counting them, you can look in the fossil record. Now you don't know, I mean, the, the way you know if it's a kind is if they can interbreed. If they can't, like a zebra and a horse, and you know, the original horse kind could interbreed, and from that comes all the different equestrian kinds. Uh, so you, you kind of do that math, and there's pro, there, they say there's about 1,000 of them. So if you double that, it's about 2,000. Of course, you have seven of the clean animals, but that doesn't make that many more. So let's just say roughly 2,000. Let's just say, let's be really generous and say 4,000. 4,000 animals need to fit on the ark. I mean, you're, you might have been thinking it needs to be hundreds of thousands or millions of animals. It's just a couple thousand, Okay. So how much room is on the ark? If you do the math and learn the cubic feet of space on the ark, it's equivalent to 522 boxcars. Okay? 522 boxcars would hold, I have this written down here somewhere. Maybe I don't. It will hold, stand by, 240 animals, average size, so when you do the math and you calculate the ark is 1.5 million cubic feet in size. It's huge. Okay, so you can have 522 boxcars on the ark. Each can hold 240. That means that you can hold 125,000 animals. And all you have is 2,000 or let's be generous and say 4,000. I mean, is there room? Easy. There's easily enough room on the ark. So if you remember, let's say 4,000 is what, the, at the very most, that would need to fit on the ark, but it can hold 125,000. There's more than enough room for all the animals, the cages, the food, the water, Noah and his family, 
and whatever they need for a year-long voyage. See? It's pretty simple. We actually have science on our side. Very common question and easy to answer. Start with Jesus mentioned Noah and end with we can actually do the calculations and figure this out um, and find out that they can all fit easily and with room to spare. How many of you have actually gone out to the ARC exhibit in, in uh, Cincinnati area? And it's, isn't that really neat when you go on there and you can just start to see the scale and scope of that? You say, and some, of, some of the people say, well, what about dinosaurs? Or what about large animals like elephants? There's actually not as many large animals as you think. There's a few big animals, but what would you do? Well, I think God's smart enough to send a young dinosaur or a young elephant that you know, will be old enough to breed when he gets off the ark, but he's smaller, uh, so he's not as big on the ark, and it doesn't take as much food and water, right? So there's an answer for all of these things, and this, this, the story of Noah and the ark, as told in the Bible, is completely scientifically possible. And Jesus seals the deal by verifying the truth of all of these Old Testament events himself. Number six. This is kind of a hard one because, you know, we, we, hate to, we hate to talk about this, but it's in the Bible. If the Bible is all about peace and love, why did King David and others kill so many people? And there were a lot of people killed in the Old Testament. Here's a response. First, always say this, God is love. And we know this is very, very, very true. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. But he did command the Israelites to kill the occupants of Canaan. The acts of the Canaanites, according to Leviticus, were so bad, their, their wickedness was so bad that the land wanted to vomit them. Okay? So let me just put it in terms that you might understand better. Would you think it's okay for the Nazis to do what they did for 400 years and, and get away with it? Would you think that's okay? No. We all say, no, that has to end, and we're glad it did. We're glad the Nazis were not able to continue for 400 years. Okay, so that's how I think you should understand the wickedness, the paganism, the rituals of the Canaanites. God gave them 400 years to repent, Genesis 15. But they didn't. So there is, there is an end to wickedness. And God told Israel to kill those enemies that were committing such heinous crimes. As a police officer, at some point, must use force to protect the innocent, right? They were sacrificing babies on the altar. Of course, we are doing the same thing today, aren't we? But these are some questions that people will ask you. Again, some of them are smoke screens. Some of them are just trying to get you off track and they really don't wanna talk and they'll just throw some questions at you. A lot of times they're legitimate questions and we have, we have a number of them, uh, other questions that we'll be answering Next time we do this, and we'll cover about 19 questions, general objections that people have. But do you understand a little bit better some of the things that people will ask you and how to answer them? You have the handouts, you have the book, Evangelism Made Simple, and we put those 19 in there because we feel like these are the ones that you almost always have these, and if you can learn these, then you'll be able to answer just about everybody. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. And I've actually seen some of the people that don't have as much uh, memory, uh, faculty, intelligence, win more people to Christ. I, I have seen it. Don't think you have to be super smart. Don't think you have to have all the answers. All you have to do is know this. Jesus is God. He came. He was sinless. He died on a cross for our sins and rose again, and if you will put your faith in him, you will have eternal life. That's all you really need to know. And if you love people, you're concerned about them, you don't wanna see them go to hell, that's all you need to know. Now, it's good that we know these answers. It's good to have a refresher. It's good to remember these things, to learn these things, because then as they ask the question, we have an answer quickly, and we can get back to the gospel, right? And some people, most Christians don't have any answers. Well, uh, why do you believe the Bible's true? So my pastor said, don't say that. Don't say that. Why do you think, why do you, why do you know the Bible's true? Well, I, hope you, 
I hope you know why you know the Bible is true. The resurrection, uh, archaeology, whatever, whatever prophecy, whatever these things are, we know the Bible's true, it's accurate. But uh, don't ever say, my pastor said, you need to know why you believe what you believe, and then as you're talking to people, uh, that'll come across as, uh, not, you're not a know-it-all, but you just have, you have some answers, and they have questions, and you'll be amazed at how far uh, you'll be able to go with people in winning them to the Lord. Uh, may God bless this study. Uh, let's uh, have a prayer, and then I'd like for you to share a little bit about some witnessing opportunities that you have. Lord, we thank you for this study tonight. We pray for that person that has yet to receive Jesus Christ, to believe in him, to trust in him, alone for their salvation, Lord, that they would do it right now, that they would make that decision to believe in Jesus as their only hope, as their only way to heaven. We thank you that Jesus came to die for our sins on a cross. We thank you that we do have answers to questions that people will have. Lord, help us to do that with meekness and grace and answer the questions people have. And Lord, we praise you for these wonderful people that have a heart for winning the lost. As we go through the community, go through our lives, uh, these folks are gonna meet people that we never will. And uh, Lord, that we can at the very least share a track, uh, tell them just a a few minutes about you. Uh, Maybe we'll have longer. But uh, at the very least, Lord, may we share with a track the gospel. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.